a talk by Alex Nadal on conflict-driven close learning set solving and how it can be used for optimization problems. Alex, without further ado, please. Okay, thank you very much. So this talk will um, consist of two parts. Uh, in the first part, I talk about core CDCL set solving, which will be mostly a review of the foundations of CDCL. And then I'll talk about solving complex optimization problems with SAT. So the first part is mostly about the past. And the second part, I believe, should be an opportunity for the future uh, based on my own industrial experience, which I will share with you. So let's get started. Let's get started from the very beginning, although everybody knows that, but still. So SAT is the problem of determining whether a Boolean formula in CNF is satisfiable. And it's the original to complete problem. There is the famous Cook Levin theorem from the early 70s, uh, which means that SAT has an exponential complexity and unless P is equal to P, whether this is, of course, uh, is frequently cited as the most important outstanding equation in computer science. So it's all down, boils down to the question if checking a solution is easy, whether it's also easy to solve the problem. And it's really an average of mystery, right? So it's one of the, you know, most intriguing open questions in computer science. Uh, but, uh, however, such solvers are highly scalable tools. So how come there is this gap between theory and, and practice? So we don't know for sure, but what we do know is that um, the fundamentals of, um, of the modern such solvers, the fundamental algorithm there is in Becker's search, and it was developed in the early 60s. It's called DPLL or DLL. So uh, let me show you how to get from some basic enumeration to DPLL, and then we will get to CDCL. So, uh, the, so we have the CN formula, right? It has two clauses here, uh, literals. Uh, yeah. And so the easiest way to solve it would be to, to, to come up with this enumeration of all the po uh, possible solutions. So we just uh, build this, this tree and then you have a vertex uh, co which corresponds to a variable and then uh, uh, Boolean values to the left and to the right. And then you have, um, so you enumerate all the solutions and then if, if there is a right square, it, uh, it means that the formula is unsatisfiable and, and the green square, which means it's satisfiable. Uh, so this is kind of the basic approach to, to solve this problem, right? A straightforward approach. But then, of course, you can also stop when the clause turns unsatisfiable, right? So in this case, the first clause turns unsatisfiable. So you can stop here. So this is one improvement made by the authors of DPLN. And then, uh, like, the most um, uh, interesting idea there was to carry out backtrack search and then stop when the first model is found because you need only one model. So you just pick a variable, you assign it to some value, and then you pick another variable, assign it some value, and then you stop uh, because the closer it turns out satisfiable, and you flip it, and you find the model. And then yet another improvement, which was introduced already in DPLL in the original, in these two original papers, is has something to do with unit clauses, where a unit clause is a clause in which one uh, variable, one letter is unassigned, and the rest are falsified. And uh, then one can observe then in, so all the clauses must be satisfied and then in, uh, the unit clause rule is um, it says that you must assign the unassigned literal, you must satisfy it, so the unassigned literal must be implied in the clause. And um, so it was observed that uh, it pays off, it really pays off to apply the unit clause rule to fixed point, which is known as Boolean constant perturbation. So in this case, you would just um, pick your variable, assign it a value, and then B would be implied by, uh, in the first clause, it's parent clause, and you would pick C, and then you would just uh, sort of find, find the model. Okay, so this is the basic DPLL algorithm. However, DPLL could handle really small formulas with under 2000 uh, clauses, and while modern sum solvers can cope with huge industrial instances, or hundreds of millions of clothes. So again, how come? Uh, and so the turning point was the introduction of CDCL, conflict-driven clause learning, or simply conflict-driven solving. And that was, in fact, the birth of modern time scale SAT solving. So the idea is to learn from conflicts, right? From those red squares to drive and tune back search. That's 
the basic idea of, of CDCL or conflict damage link. And uh, let me quickly go over the intuitive principles of modern CDCL subsolvents. So the first one is learning and pruning. So uh, whenever there is a conflict, you want to learn some strong function with some, some clauses and improve uh, the search. Then there is the locality principle. So you want to focus your search on the relevant data. So if you cannot find such data, then you will apparently fail. You won't be able to solve the formula, but the such solvers are really good at it. So they can find some local context and learn some strong clauses from, from, from that context and then go on, find another uh, local context. Okay, this is only kind of um, not, not precise understanding, right? Just heuristic understanding, but I think that if you cannot, if they cannot be local, if you cannot find a, a context to learn from, then you will just fail. Right? Then there is the third principle of well engineered data structures, um, which relates to extremely fast Boolean constraint propagation, BCP. And um, these days, there, is also, there are also some orthogonal techniques to the CDCL, like in processing and very recently local search integration. So these are the principles behind modern CDCL subsolvents. And uh, in the first part of this talk, I'll uh, um, give you an, an index dive in the core of the core. I call it core of the core, the core analysis loop and Boolean constraint propagation only. So I won't talk about the other, uh, the other algorithms um, in modern subsolvents. Now the seminal works, the two seminal works for conflict driven subsolving are the works about GRASP by Joao Marques Silva and Karim Sakala, who is just here. And then um, the work on the Chaff Satsova by the Princeton Group. And it was also awarded by the cover board. So I'll go over the algorithms of Chaff and GRASP and compare them. Uh, but first I would like to talk about Boolean constraint propagation. So the Boolean constraint propagation, BCP, is a crucial algorithm because it consumes the vast majority of the runtime of modern subsolvents. So what it does, it first it identifies and propagates in unit clauses. This is essential for performance. So you can kind of skip this first part um, because this is not really necessary. Because when you, if you, if you, even if you skip it and you, when, once you decide on the literal, you will identify that the clauses. Uh, is the unit essentially, but this is uh, really good for performance to identify unit clause and propagating them. And then it's um, essential for correctness to identify and import any conflicts. You cannot uh, afford yourself to skip conflicts, right? Because then you don't have correctness. So how is it carried out? Uh, so um, every literal calls a watch list with all the clauses where L is watched. And then when the literal is falsified, the solver goes over, visits all the clauses in, its, in the uh, watch list of not L. And uh, so it really pays off to keep that watch list short. So let's go over efficient data factors for BCP. To grasp watched all the literals, right? But then the crucial observation that it is sufficient to watch two literals was made by Han Tao Zhang uh, in Sato Sat Solver. So uh, here there are, it's, it's sufficient to watch two um, non-falsified literals. So literals which are either unassigned or satisfied to ensure, to guarantee that uh, the clause is not unit nor conflict. So you, you just hold these two pointers, but in Sato um, there was an order between uh, these two watched literals. There was a head and a tail, and then all the literals to the left of the head were, um, were falsified. You had to ensure they're falsified and, and the same goes for the literal to the right of the tail. And which also required the solver to visit clauses while backtracking. And then um, that was uh, um, that limitation was removed by the authors of, of Chaff and they observed that it is sufficient to watch the first two literals in every clause. And then you do not need to visit clauses during backtracking. Uh, you also need to make sure, though, that the decision literal of a falsified watch, if there is a falsified watch, is uh, not lower than decision level of falsified non-watches, in order to guarantee that when once you backtrack, uh, the, full, the watch literal becomes unassigned before any non-watch literal, and then we are fine. All right. So the last thing I wanted to mention here <coughs> is that uh, it was found that caching one literal of the clause inside the watch lists 
really pays off because then if that literal is satisfied, you don't need to go to the clause itself in the closed database. And so you save cache misses. And the related observation is that uh, you don't really need to store binary clauses at all um, in the closed database. So for example, Kisa does not store binary clauses. Okay, so the, this slide uh, summarizes efficient data structure for BCP. And now we go back to conflict analysis. So I, I'm now going over conflict analysis uh, algorithm of Chaff and that of Grasp. And then we'll talk about follow up. So, all right, so I'm um, considering the formula on the left. And um, let us recall how Chaff works. So, first, it would pick a decision variable, say A, at decision level one. Uh, it will try to propagate it to BCP, but here it cannot be propagated. So, it would pick um, the next decision literal, D and C and D and E. And then at this point, they actually have literals implied by previously assigned literals. So it would imply F in C5 because F turns unit. And it would imply G at C3. And then there will be a conflict because um, then C2 would become falsified. So. Here is what Chaff does when there is a conflict. It learns a, a falsified, the so-called asserting clause. So uh, the first literal in the clause is always the literal of the last decision level, then the last decision level delta, then there is a literal of decision level beta lower than delta, and then the rest of the literals must be assigned, must be falsified <coughs> at decision levels which are not higher than beta. So we have decision, the highest decision level, then the second highest decision level, and then the rest of them. And Chaff learned the so-called first thirty clauses. Um, I'll remind you about um, first thirty very soon. After that, uh, uh, Chaff backtracks to level beta, which renders this clause unit. And then you can flip C1 with C, with this clause being its parent clause, and run BCP. So that's uh, Chaff's algorithm in a nutshell. Let's continue this example. So in order to learn a clause, um, you, one can construct an implication graph. So another way to look at it would be through resolution derivation, but um, here I present this way. So in the, implica the implication graph essentially uh, shows the dependencies between the, the implications between the literals. So for example, G uh, is implied at clause C3, right? Because C was assigned uh, true and F was assigned true, et cetera. And then you can draw uh, this first UAP cut. So on the right-hand side, there is the conflict. And the, on the left-hand side, there is the reason, including the so-called uh, uh, rightmost unique implication point, which is F. So this is essentially a literal of the last decision level, which is sufficient to, out of the literals of the last decision level, it is sufficient to imply the conflict together with other literals from previous decision levels. So there it stops. And there is an associated clause, um, so which comprises not F, because F is uh, in the, on the left hand side of the cut, not C and not B. If you learn this clause, it will prevent the, the, the conflict from reappearing. So a chap would learn that clause. It would backtrack non chronologically to decision level three. So it would skip uh, uh, D, decision level of D, because it has no part in the conflict. And then um, after that, it would flip F in that newly drawn clause. And uh, there will be some, some further implications in this particular case, a conflict. Uh, so it would again generate this implication graph. The only first AP clause, which is in this case F or not A, then it would backtrack non chronologically to decision level of A because B and C do not contribute to, to the conflict and continue in this manner, okay? So this is Chaff, this is the well-known uh, classical algorithm. Let us now go back to GRASP and, and um, recall how conflict analysis loop looked in GRASP. Okay, so the algorithm was a little bit more complex. So there was a preliminary step of backtracking to the conflict level delta. That was called non chronological backtracking in GRASP. Okay, we will talk in a minute why GRASP needed this preliminary backtracking. Then it will still learn a, 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 false, a, a falsified a certain first way to close. This, this step is similar to Chaff. It remained in Chaff. GRASP also learned 
uh, a clause per every other UAP in, of the last level. But then it would backtrack to level delta minus one rather than to beta, which is currently called chronological backtracking in the modern literature. Okay. Uh, so grass would do, again, in, in, in modern terminology, would do chronological backtracking, unlike chaff. And then it would uh, again flip and imply C1. So let me show you how it works on this example. So again, we have the same example and uh, the same decisions here, A, B, C, D, and E, the same implications, and we get to the conflict. So here, first chaff would, sorry, grass would learn the first UIP close, similar to chaff. Then it would also learn the, the second UIP close, another close. Okay. So it corresponds. So here the unique implication point is E, the decision literal of the last decision level. Okay. So this is also a, a valid clause corresponding to the cut. So it would learn several clauses. If there was a third UIP, it would also learn a clause, etc. Then it would better to decision level four. So it would carry out essentially again in modern terminology chronological backtracking and would flip. Would flip F in grasp F is called uh, a special kind of flip decision variable at level five, but it, it actually proceeds as if it were a, a, a literal implied at level three. So, okay, so it, it is essentially implied at level three because C6, right, is um, um, it consists of uh, literals uh, B and C, and the highest literal of them is um, C which belongs to level three. So again, despite the fact that we are at level four, the, that this literal is implied at level three, at a lower level. And then it would imply G at level three. And this is the implication graph. So now here we have this preliminary step. The conflict occurs at level three, but, and, and we need to backtrack to the conflict level before doing conflict analysis. So gra grasp would actually backtrack at this point would remove level four because it, it's not related to the conflict. And then it would again learn, it would learn the first AP close, the second AP close, backtrack chronologically, okay, and continue in this manner. So this is the algorithm of grasp. Yes. So the summary here is that on the first conflict, the summary here on the first conflict, instead of just jumping immediately, it tries to imply the last variable that was assigned by decision to lead to a conflict, it checks to see if the other assignment is now an implication of the conflict. And if it is, then it backtrack. It wouldn't backtrack um, on the first conflict, it wouldn't backtrack non-chronological at all. It would always backtrack chronological, like, like I showed here. Well, I mean, you call it chronological, but what it but did is, okay. Yeah, <laughs> we, we have a terminology, terminology uh, yeah. a confusion over here as well. Yes. But what it does is mm -hmm. instead of just saying, I got a conflict if I make this assignment mm -hmm. and then backtracking non-chronologically, it tries the other assignment by implication. It says, since this assignment led to a conflict, the, I think what Joao Paulo called it is the uh, um, uh, failure driven assertion. Mm -hmm. It says the other value is also not a decision. It's a, it's an implication. Yes. And if that is unsaid, if that is a conflict, it, it backtracks. Yeah, I think, yeah. I mean, again, I try to formulate it in modern terminology, but this is the same algorithm. Uh, yeah, I talked to Joao essentially in a very long email, email thread and he agreed to me that this is uh, essentially the same after all. Mm -hmm. right? The interesting thing that modern solvers actually go back to grasp him, which I will show next. Um, okay, so, so let me now present or summarize an up to date conflict analysis loop algorithm, which covers grasp and chaff, but also modern solvers. So first, there is this preliminary backtracking step of backtracking to conflict level if required. Okay, so it's done by, by grasp, but not by, not by chaff. Because in Chaff, the current decision level is all um, is uh, the conflict is always the conflict level. Because Chaff backtracks not chronological. Then the solvers learn uh, an assorting clause, which is the first type of clause in both uh, Grasp and Chaff, and optionally some other clauses. For example, the other uh, clause which corresponds to the other UIPs. 
And then they backtrack to a decision level inside this interval between uh, beta, which is the uh, level in, to which Sharp would backtrack, and the delta minus one. So grass always backtracks to delta minus one, which corresponds to chronological backtracking in today's terminology. And Chuck would always better to better. Okay, now modern solos, I'll talk about it in, in the next slide. They sometimes better to beta, sometimes to delta minus one, sometimes to uh, levels in between. Okay, uh, but still, this scheme covers all the solos as far as I know, all the modern solos. And then there is this step of flipping C1 and uh, I'm applying it in the, in the newly generated flows. So this sums up the confinary loop algorithm as implemented in modern solvers and also in the first CDC solvers. Let me now talk a bit about more modern solvers, what they do. So, um, so GRASP was invented in 1996, then there was CHAF in 2001, and CHAF's algorithm, which generates one first AP clause and then does non promotional backtracking, was the state of the art for a very long time, for 17 years. Until there was this uh, our work about uh, Maple CB, so we implemented chronological backtracking in uh, the leading solvent at the time, uh, one of the versions of Maple. And what we did there is we implement a backtracking heuristic which chooses between chronological and non-chronological backtracking. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to the details, but just that at every conflict you can choose where, whether you do chronological or non-chronological backtracking, and this scheme is essentially used by um, uh, almost all the solvers except for Cadical, which I'll mention next. So it's used by Maple based solvers, Crypto Minisat, Kissat. And so one can say that modern solvers uh, um, went back, so do something uh, in between Grasp and Chaff. Okay. So they relax this uh, requirement of, of backlink and non chronologically. And it, it seems to help, especially on satisfiable uh, instances. Okay. And the chronological backtracking algorithm in, the, in these solvers is essentially very similar to GRASPs. But um, it was still a, a huge challenge to implement it because um, if you remember, GRASP uh, watched all the literals right, in, in, in the clauses, but in, in, it, it turned out that it's difficult to combine chronological backtracking with the two watched literal scheme, which is essential for efficient BCP. And this is because of simultaneous propagation at several decision levels at once. <coughs> So uh, it turned out that BCP must be adjusted to prevent not only performance issues, but also correctness issues. And then useful BCP invariants are still violated. So I'll show you an example. Yeah. Before I'll just mention Cadical. So Cadical uses um, a different backtracking scheme. It backtracks to the decision level in, um, in that level between the um, highest decision level and, and the second high decision level is the uh, greatest variable score. It's applied by Cadical and also by my solver into which I'm going to mention. Okay, so now, um, yeah, and, and in Cadical, uh, there is an integration between chronological backtracking and modern BCP schemes, of course, but it's not discussed in the paper. So we also did not discuss it in our original paper on chronological backtracking. But let me show you uh, why it is challenging to integrate chronological backtracking and BCP. Um, so, here we have this clause. Okay, so, uh, the first two literals are unassigned, and uh, the next literals are falsified at levels 20 and 30. And then uh, assume that the, the first literals are falsified at level one, which can now happen because the implication, when chronological backtracking is applied, implication can be at any level, not only at the latest level. Okay, but, and then you, and there is a conflict in this world, right? But before proceeding, you have to flip literals here. You must make sure that the first two literals are the highest in the clause. If you don't do that, you have a correctness problem. And essentially all the solvers that implement chronological backtracking do this, right? But it was not, not documented, although it's essential for correctness again. Right? Now, let me show you some invariants which are still violated even with their adjustments. So the first invariant, I call it lowest implication. It was a strong. So no assigned literal can be implied at a lower level. So essentially, this situation cannot happen. You see, there is a clause here with the 
two liters full separate at level 10, and then a liter satisfied level 20. Now, that, that liter could have been implied in this clause, right, at level 10. But in practice, and it would be better, it would have been better. But in practice, all the modern solvers, except for Intelsat, which I'm going to mention, uh, actually allow for this situation to, ha to happen. And then uh, you, you could essentially compress your decisions and compress your implications if you allow to impl imply it the literal in this clause. And then uh, another variant which is violated is I call it lowest conflict. So uh, in CHA, for example, at every conflict, BCP returns a clause fal falsified at the lowest possible level. So there are two potential conflicts here, one at level 20 and one at level 30. So a solver which implements non corrosion backtracking would all, always find the lowest conflict, but this is not the case for, for example, a key set, it could find, find this conflict first. And then it would do conflict analysis. It would learn a new clause. Eventually it would discover the, the lower conflict too, but it will take time, it will take time and effort, right? It will carry out conflict analysis for, for this clause. And then after backtracking and, and flipping and doing BCP, it would actually discover this conflict as well. There, there can be any, any, any number of these ones. So these two invariants are violated. Now, in my new solver, which I implemented like several years ago, two years ago, I have a new scheme which actually ensures lowest implication, lowest conflict. So I'm just going to, to tell you a bit, a few words about my solver, and then I'm going to move to the next topic. So it, it's an open source CDCL solver written from scratch. And there is a paper at SAT, and also recently I gave a talk, um, an elaborated talk about that solver, which you can, you can get now seminar. So there is a video of the talk. It's free, and there is a public repository. And it's tuned towards implement incremental applications with mostly satisfiable queries. In the paper, the application is anytime weighted max sets, but at Intel, they are using it for optimization problems like placement, scheduling, etc. Uh, which brings me to the second part of this talk. So now I'm going to talk about optimization problems. If there are questions about the first part, please do ask them. Uh, uh, when you're finding the, the conflict clause, uh, uh, a lot of program like like many said are, are able to, to reduce the size of that clause uh, substantially uh, do, do you take care of all those reductions as well do, do, you, you know what i mean that that uh, a, a lot of times you come up with a clause of size 20 but you can yes. reduce it to a size yeah but the decision levels do not change there so still so i do that too but it does not change the decision levels in the clause so the clause become, becomes minimized but the decision levels are the same. And so uh, this, uh, this distinction between chronological not, so it does not change the basic algorithm. That's what I mean. Although the clause is minimized. It, it does not remove decision levels from the clause. Right. Let me then move on. So now I'm going to talk about optimization, how you can solve optimization for problems with SAT. So let me formulate here the, the so-called OPSAT problem. So it goes as follows. On the input, we have a propositional formula F in conjunction on the form as in the standard SAT solver. But then there is also a pseudo Boolean objective function psi. And uh, OPSAT would return is, is, is uh, required to return a model with two the formula f, which minimizes psi. So let me just remind you that this a pseudo Boolean function is just a mapping from every full assignment to a real number. So for example, here we have a pseudo Boolean function given in a table. And then we have this formula f, it has three models, right? And then in order to, to, to find the minimal model, we just check in the table, the values for every model, right? So it's eight, it's 75, 20.4, and then uh, an opposite solver would just return M1 because it's the minimal model. So this is the problem. The problem of optimization in SAT in, in the, uh, formulated in the more generic manner, right? I don't tell you here how the function, the pseudo boolean function is provided, right? So that's the problem. 
Now, how can you solve this problem in practice? Now, it depends on psi. If psi is a, a linear function, right? Then what you can do is you can just use maxats, which is a rich and well-established field. There are many maxats out there, and they do linear optimization and such. But what if the uh, function is not linear? What do you do in that case? So it turns out there is only scarce research on the topic, almost no, no research at all. So I'm going to, to uh, tell you about uh, our contribution, the so-called Polosat algorithm, which simulates local search with SAT. And it's sufficient and simple to implement. I mean, I found it sufficient in my industrial practice. And then there, so uh, there is also another work which we did about high low level local search when you use a SAT solver or a Polosat solver as an oracle. So I'm just mentioning it here, but I won't talk about, uh, I won't go into details today. So I'll talk a bit, I talk about Polosat and then uh, I'll try to share with you some considerations about uh, you know, the importance of optimization in SAT and, and future direction. So um, now I'm going to present to Polosat. So Polosat uh, is, what it does is minimizing a black box function given a SAT formula, right? So again, you have a SAT formula and you have a function. Now the function can be provided to the algorithm when you implement it, it can be provided as a black box function, right? So just a, a function with the solver pools. So it does not have to be represented in any, any manner, right? It can be anything. Okay, so uh, how, how do you use Polosat? So first you create the CNF formula and then you call the SAT solver. And as I said, you provide uh, it a callback function. You can also call it under assumptions in incremental flows. And then the solver uh, will query the function when all the variables are assigned and it expects the function to return a, a number. Okay, and based on that, the solver does uh, optimization. And there's no need to bit, bus to, to bit blast the function into close. You can just uh, calculate it offline. So it can be a complex anything, right? complex double function. So in practice, in practice, uh, the function depends on a subset of variables normally, which I call the observables. And uh, it is strictly monotone in these observables. So when an observable is flipped from one to zero, the function is decreased. For example, it holds for max, right? So it's a linear function. So if you flip uh, any B, from one to zero, then the co coefficients are positive, and so the function goes down. But these restrictions can be lifted. Now, the idea behind Polosat is to simulate local search with a SAT solver. So here is the algorithm. First, it calls a SAT solver over the uh, formula F just to find the first approximation. Um, or optimization problem. And then there is an external loop which runs an internal loop until the model M is not improved anymore. So the algorithm tries to improve M in an any time fashion. Now, what does the internal loop do? It goes over all the bad observables where an observable is bad it, if it has never been assigned zero in any model and it tries to find a model in which it is assigned zero. So it tries to flip the current bad observable as follows. It provides it as an assumption to SAT solver, provides node B as an, as an, as an assumption. So notice here that uh, it cannot find the same model again because it, it is guaranteed by construction that we flip the value of B here. And then if um, the formula is satisfiable and we found a better model, we just update M. So that's the essence of the algorithm. Do you reach a, a local minimum? Yes, it's an incomplete algorithm. I'm going to talk about it. It's an incomplete algorithm. It can be integrated into, into complete algorithms, and I, I'm going to, to talk a bit about it. No, I meant like when you get to the local minimum, you're done. Yes. Okay, so there's no coming back. Okay. Now, in order for the thing to work in practice, there are several things you need to ensure. First, this is really crucial. You need to apply polarity fixing. What do I mean by polarity fixing? You 
uh, modify the polarity selection scheme of the sub solver. So wherever a, variable, a solver chooses a variable, you assign it a certain value. So you override the polarity decision heuristic of the sub solver to simulate local search. So in practice, what you do is, is the following thing. You fix <coughs> the uh, value of the observables to zero because you want to go to the local minimum. You want to go to the minimum. And the other rest of the variables, you fix them to the uh, best model so far. And that makes the solver, so uh, that makes the solver do local search around the latest solution with some bias towards the minimum or a minimum. Okay, this is a crucial step. That it makes the algorithm to simulate a local solution because you always look for, for a closed solution. Um, another thing which has to be done is to use a conflict threshold for every invocation in practice because otherwise you might get stuck and you, you don't want to because you have many, many calls to make and it's just an incomplete algorithm. And then uh, another thing which helps is, is sorry, to boost the variable scores of the observables so, so, so that you would start with the observables. But if you just fix them to zero and, and you know, if, if you use them as assumptions, it would never finish because it's too strong. But if you just boost the, 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 the response, it normally makes the algorithm work faster, to work, work faster because it will start with a solution closer to the minimum. Okay, so that's the algorithm. As I said, it's an incomplete algorithm. But it can be integrated into a high level complete algorithm by just by replacing, if you have a high level complete algorithm, just linear search, for example, which we will go over next, then you can just replace sub queries by polo sub queries and you are done. And then your complete algorithm will still work and it will work faster in my experience. So that's the idea. Now uh, I'm going to talk about an application. So this is an industrial application. We are actually using this algorithm in production at Intel. And for several applications, this is kind of the main application. And the application is placement. So um, the problem is about placing cells on a grid. Okay, um, so for example, this is a, 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 an example instance and uh, this is a solution. So we just place these cells here, right? So there are no further constraints here, so they're placed, and this is a solution, and this problem is already to complete because the grid is restricted. That's what makes it incomplete, right? right? Because if there was a limited space, then it's a simple problem, but it's limited. Then in, in practice, you also need to optimize your placement. So there are so-called nets. So the cells are, are, are marked with nets. And the placement go okay. So the net size is the perimeter of the bounded box of um, of the box bounding all the cells which belong to that net. So for example, okay, and so this yellow bound uh, bounding box for net one. This is bounding box for net one because uh, it it goes it bounds C one right, and then and C three and C five. So there, are, there are three cells which are marked with, with um, net one and they're bounded. So this is an example. And the goal is to minimize the sum of all the net sizes. So you want to sum of all the net sizes to be minimum. That's the goal in practice. Because then, um, again, in industrial practice, if you place them and, and you follow this optimization requirement, then uh, routing is much easier. So you have a, a good placement. So that's the idea. Now, in practice, there are also some additional constraints which are translated to sub. But I'm not, not going to talk about them. Now, how can you solve placement? Um, so you can translate it to bit vector logic and then through bit, bit vector logic to sub. So essentially, um, so every cell has a constant width and constant height. And uh, the, uh, so we introduce two bit vectors which represent the bottommost corner of every cell. And then um, to find the solution, one has to ensure that there is no overlap between each pair of cells. And the constraint is written down here. So it's quite simple. So this is a constraint in bit vector logic, but it can be bit plus translated to SAT. 
And also, you have to make sure that all the cells are placed inside the grid. The constraint is skipped here, but it's again, it's quite an, a simple constraint. And this way, you can translate placement to SAT. Of course, if you have additional constraints, you can just um, add them to the formula. All right. Now, if you want to uh, your solution to be optimal in some way, then you have an instance of the so-called optimization model bit vectors problem or BV problem. So, um, so in this case, we have the constraints, and then we also need to uh, minimize the value of the so-called optimization target T, right? where the Ni expresses the net size for every net. So you can just you, you can create this variable for every net. This is a bit vector formula here, yeah. and then you have this target to minimize. And you can provide it to uh, two which does optimization model bit vectors. Now these two they do either binary search or linear search essentially. And here I am going to show you how you can solve it with linear search because it's faster in practice than binary search. But first you assert your formula, find the solution, and, you, and then you just do linear search. While mu is still a solution, you you, you assert that the, the value of the target should be lower then it's very new and you call it so just, this is just linear search this is a complete algorithm and an anytime algorithm which is good and it essentially all outperforms binary search algorithms but it still gets stuck in practice on, on uh, industrial placement instances now what you can do is just to, to run the same algorithm and replace sat invocations with call sat invocations and essentially you are done you have a, a, a new algorithm, and uh, then I'm going to show it's faster than if you use SAT only. And now, to uh, implement polar SAT, you, you need to provide a callback function. In this case, the function would simply return the value of the target bit vector under the current model. And the observables would be the bits of the net sizes. And then the function is monotone and big. And that's it. And then you can do it. You can pick. You can um, pick an algorithm, a complete algorithm, and replace your sub by polar sub -pulse. You need to define your optimization, your black box optimization function, and the observables. Okay. That's what we do. And then, so uh, I'll show you some results on industrial benchmarks. So let me just go to the results. So here, what we have, this is a time scale from 50 seconds to 600 seconds. And we measure quality for every uh, timeout, and the quality is just a normalized quality. So one is the best result, and in this case, 0 0.6 is the worst result. Now, the red graph here is binary search with SAT. The blue one here is is a linear search with SAT. So you can see that linear search is better than binary search. And there is a huge gap here. And what is important for for this talk is that green line here. This is linear search with polar SAT. So you can see that there is a huge difference right, between the blue and the, and the green line. And here we have a virtual best, and the rest uh, of the figures uh, uh, correspond to this the follow up paper, which I mentioned, which does um, local search with the SAT or polar SAT over as an oracle. So that improves the solution further, but still, you see there is a huge gap here between linear search with SAT and linear search with polar SAT. That works well in practice. And then uh, we also integrated Polosat into a Maxat solver, TT Open WW Inc. It was the winner in Max evaluation uh, four years ago. And again, we just replaced SAT invocations with Polosat invocations. But um, a crucial step in the context of Maxat was to use an adaptive strategy to stop Polosat when it gets too slow. That would make made it work for Maxat inside the Maxat solver. Because in Maxat, you really need to be quick. And, uh, because it's kind of linear search, a linear optimization function, and it's easier uh, than um, more complex nonlinear functions. And then uh, you can see that, again, these are the results. So here, uh, this is the baseline solver. Again, we have here timeouts from uh, one minute to, to half an hour. And here is the quality, the higher, the better. And uh, so this is the baseline solver. The blue one and Polosat is the red one. It's, there are some modifications, um, other modifications, other solvers, but again, there is a huge gap. 
in um, the basin solver and, and proof. Yeah. So this algorithm works in practice. <coughs> and essentially it was, uh, so we are using it for industrial optimization problems at Intel and um, in the latest market evaluation, it was used by the winner in all the incomplete categories, uh, which was the WLSC. Okay, now, okay, now I'm done with describing you know, my, my own issues, my own approaches to, to solving this problem. And the point I wanted to make next is, is that I think that solving complex nonlinear optimization problems is an opportunity for the SAT community. So um, it is well known that currently SAT based verification comprises the heaviest users of SAT in the industry, right? So if you go to, for example, to the CAV 22 program, there were several invited talks. So there was a talk by Ziad Hanner um, from Cadence uh, harnessing the power form of verification for the trillion dollar chip design. Right? So it's about verification. Another talk by Neha Runta from Amazon, a billion SMT queries a day, which is again about verification. So using SAT for verification. But what about industrial optimization problems? So I think there should be many of them right, in practice. And uh, how could you solve them? So you can do it with, with the integer linear programming, but then if the problem is non-linear, there are also some approaches which improve, uh, like no, which, which do non-linear programming, but um, it's not easy to do that because there might be some Boolean constraints. And also uh, it's not, it's really not very well known how you do it if your function is a black box function. Um, so, and as I said, we only have something working in the industry. So my intuitive feeling is that um, there is a lot of place of, for exploration here. Um, so just let me uh, talk about several ideas which I had, but I'm sure there are many more ideas. How you can solve complex optimization problems with SAT. So first we used, so we, we are using SAT based local search, but there is of, of course classical local search, which you, one can also use. And local search is now a component of modern SAT solvers and uh, I believe it can also be harnessed for solving optimization problems, like with nonlinear objective functions. I can think about uh, dedicated algorithms for uh, subclasses of optimization functions. And now the constraints, as I presented it, the constraints are just closes, but you can think about other types of constraints, for example, uh, pseudo Boolean constraints, right? And then you could come up with um, optimization algorithms for for other types of constraints, not, not only uh, uh, complex optimization functions, but al al also more complex constraints. And then uh, one can look for more applications. So again, so I think that I think that if we have industrial applications at Intel, that, that's just because we are looking there. You know, if if you look at, at the broader industrial problems, I'm quite sure one can find many optimization problems which are currently not very well solved. So that's my message for this part of the talk. And I think that I am done. Yes. So thank you for your attention. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, Alex, I just have clarification questions. Yes. So when you say um, we have these constraints about the placement, mm -hmm. these are encoded as Sienna clauses as well, yes. right? And so the question is that um, uh, Sienna formula, mm -hmm. uh, how many satisfying solutions does it typically have in an application? Many. Does it have it lots many, or yeah, a lots couple? Of yes. it has, it, normally it has lots of solutions. And um, so you just need to find a, a good solution out of many solutions, which it has. And yeah, I think that maybe you're thinking about uh, symmetry breaking. Are you thinking about no, 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 I'm not thinking. I'm just because thinking I, about, I, I, okay. So you have, you have this objective function, you know, which is the thing that you want to optimize, right? And it depends on these uh, Boolean variables that describe the constraints. Yes. Um, you know, if the problem, if the constraints are infeasible, then that optimization is just meaningless, right? So it must have, I'm just curious to know, are there many, many, many solutions that will give you some value of the objective function? And then you're looking for the smallest one, for example. Yes, that, normally there are many, many solutions and you're looking for the minimum. So yes, the, I understand. One good solution and also, Again, uh, uh, you do not really have to encode your function into closes. I understand that too. But, but yeah, I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, 
So the next question is, every time somebody talks about local search in the context of backtracking search, I get extremely confused. Okay. So what exactly is the local search that's happening over here? Is it self solver after it finds a solution now, flipping bits and seeing if there are in the neighborhood any other solutions? Is that what's happening? What so is that what Polosat is doing? I... So assume you, you found the solution and yeah. you want to find the solution nearby. You want to make the set solver finding right. the solution nearby. Right. The one thing you can do independently of Polosat and say you block the solution, then you want to find the solution nearby. You just modify your polarity selection heuristic. So as every time variable is picked, its polarity is fixed to the polarity in the solution. And then you're likely to find the solution nearby. And that's simulates local search. So that's that's kind of the core of, of what I mean. You see, so again, you 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 ran a start solver over some problem or over a of formula, you found the solution independent of optimization. Now you want you want to find a close solution. A solution nearby. So you block your, your, your previous solution, for example, with the close. And what, what you do, you run your solver incrementally and you modify its polarity selection heuristic. So it picks a variable, and instead of using this uh, face saving polarity selection or whatever, you just always select the value in the latest model for every variable. And then you will stay close to the last model. And that's why I, I, talk, I, I um, refer to it as, as local search, because you kind of stay low, you stay near okay. latest model. I mean, my understanding of local search is you get a complete assignment and then you arbitrarily flip a bit and you get a neighbor. Yes, in classical is local search. But here, here, here in Polosat, you flip a bit differently by... by uh, okay. So call uh, it something else. Don't call it local search. That's all. Thank no. <laughs> Search. Yeah, it's another way of doing local search. It's confusing. I mean, because. Oh, but I wanted to make a point that it's actually doing some kind of local search. Although some kind uh, in, of local search, computer. but not right. the classical local not, search. Not the classical local search. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, have you thought about using maybe a course somehow to um, speed up your solver? Because you, you find the solution, you look around, but then maybe. When you find a new solution, when you do this local search, okay, you like the name of the whatever looking around the neighborhood, you you forgot everything that you. Yeah, it could be a good idea, but I, I didn't do any research on that. But yeah, com like combining local search maybe and the, like answer based massive algorithms would be could potentially be a good idea. I just want to quickly ask the cell placement uh, problems. What sort of um, industrial tasks does that come up in? Ah, just placement. You need to, so um, if you design a chip, eventually you need to place transistors on the chip, right? right. So okay. you need to place all you know, billions of transistors. And so you divide these tasks into many subtasks. So first you place uh, transistors in the cell. For that, you need placement. Then is you place cells, like in uh, what's called the farm. And then you place places place, uh, you place fabs on a partition. Then you place uh, partitions on a chip. So there are many stages of placement, but you know we need to do it somehow. Thanks. So actually, uh, two comments on two questions. So for the last one from Nina, uh, I think this is happening naturally if they are using Polosat in some algorithms where you are optimizing as a problem that is defined by the core that you just got in the solver, in the MaxSat solver. So in some MaxSat solvers, you have a core on the soft closes, and then you optimize that sub problem. Yeah. If you are using PoloSat, then you are using information in the early of the, the core, okay? It's not that you are covering all the soft closes. You are just focusing on a sub problem. And the yeah, other- It's already happening. Is that what you mean? Yes, I mean, you are optimizing just as a problem, just as a subset of the soft closes. Mm -hmm. You are trying to get the, the best assignment there. Mm -hmm. And actually, uh, a name for this local search that uh, Sakara was, why, why not to call it max at face saving, right? This is something max like. It's not only for, it works not only for max, right? Uh, yeah, but um, more or less, this is what you are doing. This is face saving, right? Not, re not really, because there is this algorithm which, which tries to flip. Bits like a local search, right? So you go over all the all the bed observables and, and you try to flip them. So I mean, understood that you said that you block the solution. No, no, it? but that's not what I do. Right? That's just ah, okay. for, for sake of an example. But okay, okay. Really, that was a scan. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's like go over these observables and try to flip them, but instead of uh, working on complete assignments, you find a solution and and then 
the polar sat solver and always flip a bit. That's why I called it local solver because you know I do it by flipping one, one variable. But instead of operating complete assignments, you just run a sat solver with that bit, the negation of the bit being, being an assumption. And you also use um, polarity, you know, face saving is polarity selection schemes. Um, yeah. And you also need to use conflict selection, otherwise it doesn't work. But there are some subtle things. Um, so you mentioned about uh, nonlinear optimization for detectors. Yes. Yeah. So um, have you thought about like going into do some reduction to NIA? Because uh, recently, like uh, SMT NIA has improved a lot. Yeah. Uh, we we tried doing something with large bit width, like two fifty six bit width via going to NIA, mm -hmm. and uh, it turned out to be better than uh, bit blasting. So, it depends on the constraints. So um, you have some constraints which which can be easily expressed as like so-called design rules. So I, I haven't talked about it at all, but there are some additional constraints which we are adding to the formula. And in order to use nonlinear arithmetic, you would need to somehow convert them to nonlinear constraints. And I'm not entirely sure it's um, one can do it efficiently, but you know, one may check. Yeah. So, uh, we did some OMTNIA and uh, solving bit vectors with large bit with like 256 with nonlinear constraints. Okay. Wyania. So I guess it would be a nice direction yeah. to do with DD. Okay, maybe a couple of more questions. Uh, hi, just an observation. And then I, I have a question, but I guess they are separate. I don't want to be in the game of sort of finding a name for this, but I think it could be called local search because. For me, the defining feature is you have a solution, mm -hmm. then you have a local neighborhood, yes. and then you evaluate candidate solutions in the neighborhoods. And right. through the face saving and the bit flipping, yes. you do have a neighborhood definition. Yes, right. Uh, my solution was, my question was different though. Uh, there's a related paradigm I, I thought is, as you gave, uh, as you went through the talk, which is large neighborhood search. Is this something you compare against? How does, how does it relate to large neighborhood search? Um, Maybe it relates to the, our follow-up work. In that work, what we do is uh, we use a SAT or a polar SAT solver as an oracle, and we do local search on top of it. So, uh, and maybe this relates somehow to, to large neighborhood search, because we are using these solvers to, to again to look for solution in the neighborhood. So we have this local search inside this SAT solver, polar SAT, and then on top of that, we are also trying to find the solutions in neighborhoods too. Yeah, well, I didn't talk about it, but maybe we can talk offline. Thank you. Maybe it's fitting that the last question in a talk about conflict driven close running SAT solving is given to Karam again. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I just, you mentioned something about boosting V sits, and I didn't quite understand that. Ah, so, yeah. boosting the scores of V yes, sits, yes. you know, is hastening finding conflicts. No, 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 no. no. The idea is the form. So, you have. Um, the observables, and you, you, want, you want to find a solution which in which the observables are, are uh, zero, are minimized, right? A, so, a solution with um, as many falsified observables as possible. Now, you, there is the polarity selection heuristic, which, as, would as, which assigns them zero, independently of the variable selection. But then if, if you select them first, if this it selects these variables first, there is a better chance to get a solution which is minimal. You see, if, for example, if you always select them, if you force your uh, variable decision heuristic to select them first always, then well, the solver will get stuck, but you will get the minimal solution if it, does, if it doesn't by chance. If you always select them first, right? Because then you would always select them first and try to assign them zeros. So you select them to assign Can them. Can you just zeros. define to me what observable means here in this context? What's an so observable, observable variable? So observables are the variables on which this function is defined. So you want to find a solution in which uh, function we have minimized. Right? Yeah. So you want to find a solution in which the observables are as close to zero as possible. Right? Okay. What is the scope of your objective? Like, why is it different from this? What, what, why is observables the set of observables different than the scope of your objective function? Well, it's it's yeah, it's the the variables on which the function depends. So yeah, yeah. So variables involved in the objective function. 
it's not really variables involved in the objective functions, it's the variables in which, so this narrow usage, the, the function um, is monotone the observables. So if you flip uh, the observ an observable from one to zero, then the function gets uh, closer to zero. And it, it doesn't hold for every variable which are uh, you know, used by the function. Oh, so the scope of the objective function can be bigger than the set yes. of observables. Yes. yes. <clears throat> thank you. I think let's thank the speaker again. And we're now having half uh, an hour break. Uh,